Welcome, my Canadian cousins. Greetings, salutations from south of the border. Welcome, happy holidays to those whom I appreciate so very much. I am doing a video today uh, from a wonderful YouTube channel called Canadiana that dives deep into Canadian history stories that are probably not taught in your textbooks in school. I'm dating myself by even saying textbooks, but you know what I mean. Um, very intricate stories. I'm a subscriber of their channel. I love them. I don't know why I have not reacted to them before, but this has uh, been on my mind because the movie Napoleon with Joaquin Phoenix is out now, and a lot of people are talking about it, and, and a lot of history channels are sort of reviewing it. I have not seen it yet. I do intend to see it. I know a lot about the Napo Napoleonic Wars and Napoleon's life from his humble beginnings as a minor son from a minor Corsican noble family to uh, ultimately the uh, emperor of France and conqueror of Europe to his downfall and his final exile, the island of St. Helena in, 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 uh, after the battle, battle of Waterloo in Belgium. I, uh, actually visited Napoleon's tomb when I visited France years ago. Here's me being serious. Here's me being somewhat of a jerk and disrespectful. <laughs> um, but that was to make my wife laugh in fairness. Um, but you know what? Uh, I was looking and I saw, came across this video from the channel Canadiana, which is one of my favorite channels. I'm a subscriber to them and I think they're absolutely wonderful. This particular video is the Toronto forest that brought down Napoleon. I've not previewed this, but I just knowing what I know about the era, what I think is because, you know, Napoleon had certainly had um, superiority in numbers on the continent of Europe, but there were through multiple coalitions of European allies, a lot allied against him. Uh, and he famously, you know, invaded Russia and got caught up in a retreat in a terrible winter and decimated his ranks. But the British had always had naval superiority and, and certainly put their stamp on that in the Battle of Trafalgar. So if I had to guess what the Toronto forest that brought down Napoleon means is knowing that there are not a lot of woodland in the Isle, Isle of Great Britain. Brit Britain always looked to its um, colonial holdings for resources, and probably what this means is that they used the timber of the forests of Canada, of what is now Canada, to build and maintain their naval superiority. And if I'm wrong, I'm wrong, but I think I'm right. And let us check out this video and we shall see my friends. As always, I will see you on the flip side. This is Rouge Park on the very edge of Toronto. Every day, countless hikers and joggers escape the bustle of the big city to explore these peaceful forests, winding their way through the woods on old, well-trodden paths. But most of them have no clue that these aren't all ordinary hiking trails. Is it called Rouge Park because in the fall the leaves get very bright and red? Just curious. One of them is part of an incredible story. This trail is more than 200 years old, and it's connected to some of the most dramatic events in history, born in a time of bloody war to bring down an emperor half a world away. This is Canadiana. Rouge Valley has been an important place since long before Toronto was founded. 
The first people to blaze trails through its forests were the ancestors of today's First Nations, prehistoric hunters who stalked its slopes thousands of years ago. And in the 1600s, the Seneca village of Genetset Wyagon sat high on a hill overlooking the valley. The river below was a vital trade route, attracting famous French explorers, fur traders, and missionaries. It wasn't until the late 1700s that the British showed up. They came to build a new city York, along right? that old trade route. A tiny, muddy frontier town that would eventually grow to become the biggest metropolis in Canada. Toronto was founded in 1793, a notorious year in European history. At the same time, the British were laying out the settlement's first roads here on the shores of Lake Ontario. Far on the other side of the Atlantic, the streets of Paris were soaked in blood. Yeah. The French Revolution was at its terrifying height. Liberty, equality, of terror. and fraternity had turned into tyranny, paranoia, and slaughter. And soon, France was at war. The revolutionaries who'd been guillotined aristocrats in Paris were now fighting with nearly every monarchy in Europe. And by 1796, they'd started winning their battles thanks to a popular new general who led the French army to one victory after another. His name was Napoleon Bonaparte, and it seemed as if no one could beat him. Before long, he had seized power in France, crowned himself emperor, and built a network of conquests and alliances that stretched from one end of Europe to the other. By the winter of 18... Super overly simplistic, but good enough. But I, I get it, because that's not really the story. 1806, there was only one country left standing in the way. Great Britain. Britain was next on Napoleon's list. There was just one big, floating, wooden problem. The Royal Navy. The British fleet had ruled the waves for the last hundred years. Napoleon's fleet was no match for it. When they clashed at the Battle of Trafalgar, the French Navy was left in tatters. And Spanish. But Napoleon still had another way of dealing with the Royal Navy. He could take away their wood. It took thousands of trees to build a single ship, but England was running out of forests. They've been chopping them down since the Stone Age. The trees they needed to make masts for their ships were especially hard to find. They were made of big, strong, old growth pines. The British didn't have any of those left. Strong, old growth pines, but pines have to, uh, are, were also soft enough to be flexible, which the masts needed to be. Those left, they shipped them in from the far side of Europe, from the towering forests on the shores of the Baltic As Sea. As opposed to oak. Shores that were now controlled Probably by would Napoleon. Break. In fact, he controlled just about all of Europe, which meant he could declare an embargo. No one was allowed to trade with England. And just like that, Napoleon had robbed the Royal Navy of their Baltic masts. The future of Europe hung in the balance. Without masts, there would be no navy. And without a navy, there would be no stopping Napoleon. Looking for the right time to pause, yes. Nobody could trade with uh, Britain, and Britain said nobody could trade with France, which is part of the cause of the War of 1812, which I know you all know very well. I'm going to do a video about that in the not too distant future from the Canadian perspective because I've learned a lot about it from your perspective over the last uh, year and a half and I definitely want to explore that and it is in some small sense a result of what was going on in Europe with the Napoleonic Wars. That's where Toronto comes in. The city was still just a tiny little frontier town surrounded by old forests, including this one. And this forest was full of masts. 
Now, it was axe-wielding lumberjacks making trails through these woods. In fact, it was those lumberjacks who made this trail. With the British Empire at war, they came to the Rouge Valley to find the biggest and oldest white pines they could, then bring them crashing to the ground. Those huge logs were then floated down the Rouge River to Lake Ontario and shipped down the St. Lawrence to make the long journey across the Atlantic. And it wasn't just happening in Toronto. There were forests all over eastern Canada, so the lumberjacks got to work. Timber exports went up by about a thousand percent in just four years. Tens of thousands of masts headed across the Atlantic. When you think about that they were doing that with no power tools, that, you know, n no gigantic cargo ships, this was all just on the labor of human beings, uh, it, it's actually astounding. It's astounding. And Napoleon's feeble navy couldn't do anything about it. The trees chopped down in the Rouge Valley rose again as masts from the decks of British ships, fighting the French half a world away. The Royal Navy was saved. Napoleon never did invade England. His embargo eventually broke down, and soon his empire crumbled. He was defeated and exiled by a coalition of European powers, and then escaped only to be defeated and exiled again, this time for good. He ended up on the island of St. Helena in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and that was it for him. And I think there was a permanent blockade, so he could never again leave. But even with Napoleon gone, the British still wanted Canadian lumber. Trees kept coming down and exports kept going up. Soon forestry had taken over from the fur trade as the engine of the Canadian economy. And today, it's still one of the country's biggest industries. There are no more lumberjacks in the Rouge Valley though. The forests growing here today are protected. Great. Rouge Park is now a national urban park. Here, you can still find enormous white pines towering above the forest floor. Some have been growing here since those Napoleonic days. This old logging trail is now known as the Mast Trail in memory of that time. And 21st century Torontonians and tourists can walk in the very same place those lumberjacks did as they wage their wooden war against Napoleon more than 200 years ago. Those pine trees weren't just used to build ships in England. Before the Napoleonic Wars were over, he looked unhappy. some of the biggest warships in the world were being built in cities like Toronto and Kingston to fight bloody battles on Lake Ontario. Napoleon wasn't the only one with an embargo. The British had one against him, too. This meant neutral countries like the United States were caught in the middle, and the tensions that stoked soon boiled over into another war. The U.S. declared war on Britain. That's what I was talking about, Brits, my friends. distracted by Napoleon, the Americans seized their opportunity to invade the Canadian colonies. The War of 1812 had begun. Suddenly, the Great Lakes were a battlefield too. Control of Lake Ontario became vitally important. If the Americans could take the lake, they'd be able to sail down the St. Lawrence River and attack Montreal. So. A naval arms race broke out, with both sides rushing to build the most powerful fleets they could. Those warships unleashed horrors on the waters of Lake Ontario. The battles were so gory that some crews spread sand Soak across their the decks blood. to keep them from getting too slippery. Others painted them red so the blood would blend in. Many were killed on both sides, but the Americans never did manage to take Lake Ontario. The Canadians eventually built their most powerful ship yet. 
HMS St. Lawrence had more than a hundred guns, a crew of 700, and was even bigger than the British flagship that had led the fleet to victory over the French. Bigger than HMS Victory that still still exists, but and, and it's still a commissioned ship in the British Navy. And um, coming out of the War of 1812 was the USS Constitution, which was a frigate, not nearly that big, not, not, not like a big ship of the line. And it is still the oldest commissioned ship in the United States Navy. And unlike Victory, it's still seaworthy and it's still, they still sail it out into Boston Harbor every once in a while. This was fascinating. Um, I really, really enjoyed it. And so I think they're probably going to cover the War of 1812 uh, at some point. Maybe, you know, I've been, like I said, I've been wanting to do that. Um, I really enjoyed this. I promise I didn't watch this beforehand. I did predict a couple of things that they talked about in here, but it's, it's just purely because of I'm a history nerd. <laughs> um, I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, what he, I, I, I'm leaving their commercial in. And, you know, I'm sorry if, you, if it's making the video a little too long, but I think it was important because I did notice when I was looking through this stuff that they have um, a lot of their videos in French as well. And, of course, being a bilingual, bilingu is that how you say it? We say bilingual, a bilingual country uh, yourself. That is um, probably important because I don't see a lot of other Canadian YouTube channels that are either Anglophones doing that or francophones doing that um well the francophones probably more so but uh, i don't know i don't know what i'm talking about i don't know what i'm talking about sorry guys all right anyway i'm done and i appreciate your watching please like and subscribe if you did like it and i will see you guys soon if i don't talk to you before christmas i think i will it's a few days before as you can see tree you know, stockings in my messy family room. Uh, have a very, very Merry Christmas and Happy and Healthy New Year. And enjoy your holidays. Happy belated Hanukkah and just peace. Peace, my friends. Take care.